So what, why does God say by faith? Paul's going to start with that question in verse 13 here as he continues with Abraham as an illustration. He says, For the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be the heir of the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. And say, so he's using Abraham again, saying as the, the religious people of Paul's day would have thought, hey, it's because these people obeyed that God gave them all this stuff. But Paul's coming back and saying, look, the law didn't even exist in Abraham's time. The law came through Moses, the Bible tells us. That's hundreds of years after Abraham lived. So he's going back to, to, to really use the truths that these religious people held but they had fallen away from, just as we do nowadays. This is a revealing of our nature. As one great theologian said, uh, our hearts are idol makers. In 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 and of ourselves, our hearts, in a sense, create idols. We're going to create things to worship until we settle on the truth that God is the only one worthy of that worship. And, and we'll go so far as even making religion. We'll associate it with God, but we'll, we'll start that path and we'll say, hey, I'm not going to worship money. I'm not going to worship sex or pleasure or power, all these things that the world says is bad. But we'll go to religion and we'll worship it that way. And it's still ourselves. We're creating our own rules, our own guidelines, and we're working our way up to a God that we've created rather than worshiping the God who's clearly revealed himself. And so Paul's making that argument very clear here about what's happening. And it didn't come through the law, but through righteousness of faith, which we've been looking at. And then he goes on to explain it in verse 14. For if it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. Meaning there's no need for faith and the promise becomes void. Why does the promise become void? Verse 15 tells us, for the law brings wrath. But where there is no law, there is no transgression. Here's what Paul's saying. The law brings wrath because every single one of us has broken the law. And we learned if you break one part of the law, you break the whole law. And the problem is no matter how hard you try, you continue to break the law. So if if the law is the means, then all we're ever going to earn from the law is God's discipline and his wrath. But he says, where there's no law, there's no transgression. Meaning where the law doesn't exist to accomplish it, there's no transgression uh, credited us. By transgression, Paul means actually intentionally breaking the law. He's not saying that there's no sin. Paul talked about that earlier. Sin exists whether there's a law or not. We fall short of God's glory. Transgression is a word that means a rebellious breaking of a law that you know was there. It's like Adam and Eve in the garden. It became a transgression because God said, do not eat of this tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They knew not to eat of it, and what did they do? They went ahead and ate. That's a transgression. Sinning is just falling short of God's standards, whether you're aware of it or not. And then we get to verse 16. I love this passage. In fact, uh, I had to chuckle as I was reading this. It's in here twice, and it's really key to this whole passage. Uh, It's a phrase, maybe if you have young people in your household or you hang around young people, it's a phrase that's used a lot now with young people. That's why. That's why you hear them say that. They don't, doesn't always, they just fit in whatever. Why why didn't you take out the garbage? Well, Dad, that's why. What's why? That's why. You ever hear kids saying that? We have some young people on our staff that use that phrase all the time. As I was reading this passage, I came to verse 16. I thought, you know what? I tease them about this, but this is a biblical phrase. Look at what Paul says right there. (laughs) Paul says it a little longer. He says, that is why. But really what he's saying is, that's why. why. Why did God do it that way? He says, that's why. It depends on faith. And now here's the purpose. Underline this. Circle that. That is why. Underline in order that. It's telling us the purpose. Why did God create a faith that depends on faith? In order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring. Not only to the adherents of the law, that's Paul's phrase at this point to the Jewish people that, they, you know, that held the law and thought they, they were trying to adhere to it. So it's not only so that they could receive this promise, but also to the ones who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all, which Paul showed earlier is not just Jews, but anyone who had faith in God and that faith is credited to him as righteousness, whether he was following the law or not following the law, was under the law or not under the law. So it's any of us. It's us in general as Gentiles, non-Jewish people who have put our faith in Jesus Christ. So there's our first point. Here's uh, right in that passage, it tells us that God's promise 
is through faith so that it can rest on grace and be guaranteed to all who believe. This is why God chose to operate in this way, that it could be through faith so it can rest on grace. Grace is undeserved favor. It's why we say this every single Sunday. Welcome to grace. Grace is a gift of God. God wanted to offer his salvation through faith and grace. It's, it's him doing it. So he gets the glory, he gets the credit, and not us. Not to mention the fact that we could have never earned it on our own. So two of those things are really important. It's by grace, it's a gift he offers, and it's guaranteed. If we go by the law, there's no guarantee. You're constantly going, well, what if I break it? What if I break the law right before I die? In fact, there's a whole lot of religious practices that happen in the name of Christianity that are trying to cover that up. They're trying to forgive people's sins right before they die. Well, what happens if they don't get there in time? Or what happens if someone dies it's too quickly for that to happen? It's because of a faulty view of what the scriptures say. If your salvation is based on your works, then you are constantly wondering, am I saved or am I not saved? Am I safe and secure in my Father or am I not safe and secure in my Father? Paul is making that very clear. God has chosen to save through faith so that it can be understood as a gift of grace and so that it can be guaranteed to all of his offspring. It's a done deal. Ephesians 1 talks about the fact of his Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is deposited. He's an escrow deposit in your heart when you believe. He seals your heart. And the term is used just like in a legal transaction. When you put down an escrow on a home, and you say, I'm putting this money down as a deposit, and if I default, if I don't follow through on this contract and purchase the home when the date comes that it needs to be finished, then I lose my deposit. That's what an escrow is. God says that's what the Holy Spirit is in your life and mine. He is his escrow deposit, meaning if God doesn't finish the work of salvation in your life that he started when you trusted in Jesus Christ, then he loses his deposit the Holy Spirit. You see what God's banking on? He's saying the Trinity will be split in two if I don't do what I say I promise to do. You can't make it any more clear than that, and Paul is making that clear for us. That's the beauty of our salvation. It's by grace. It's his work in us, and it's guaranteed, not based on our performance. So let's ask the second question then. So how does he save by faith? Why does God save by faith? It's so it can be a grace, a work of grace on his part. It can reveal how good he is. That's why we sang that song today. He's a good father. He's not one that's sitting there saying, you guys got to jump higher and higher and higher to get up to meet my standard. No, he says, I met that standard for you. The only way you can't have this gift is if you choose not to receive it. You see, a wage you earn. You work for it. You deserve it. You get it. And it's owed to you. But the only way, the only way you don't get a gift is if you choose to not receive it. That's what God's saying here. That's what Paul's writing about. Now, how does he say by faith? Verse 17 says this as Paul goes back to the scriptures and says, As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations in the presence of the God in whom he believed who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. So the, Paul's just stating that this is the promise God made to Abraham. I have made you the father of many nations. He made that promise to Abraham while he still didn't have any children. Sarah, his wife, had been bar barren her whole life. Abraham, they were old at that time. And he said this in the presence of God himself. He made, he, God formed a covenant afterwards. And if you look at that covenant even, God was the only one that participated in the covenant. He's saying, this covenant is 100% dependent on me. A typical covenant in that day would have involved both parties signing on the dotted line. But in Abraham's covenant with God, God was the only one that signed. He put Abraham to sleep. He said, you step out of the way. I am fulfilling this covenant. So how does he say by faith? That passage is packed with information, and it's this basically right here, that only God, here's your second point, only God has the power to give life to the dead and make exist 
what does not exist. How does God save by faith? He saves by faith because faith puts our trust in his ability. God's the only one that can bring to life something that's dead. He's the only one who can make exist something that doesn't exist. Now, we think we can as humans, but honestly, all we ever do is shape or reform things that have already existed. Everything we have ever created as human beings has never brought something into existence that never existed before. All we've done is rearrange and put together things that already exist. God is the God who makes exist what never existed. When he created the universe, he spoke it out of nothing. God gave life to the dirt when he shamed the when he shaped the first man. He breathed into it and gave life. He caused something to exist that had never existed. So salvation by faith allows our salvation to rest on God's power and not ours. Just ponder this for a moment. What is impossible for a God like this? Why would we ever want to rest on our own merit, our own ability, when God says, why don't you rest on mine? Look at what I'm able to do. In fact, just consider the reality of of God's promise to Abraham for a moment. Even with the most critical dating of the Old Testament, the most liberal people who had dated that don't believe in the Bible, even then, if you take those dates for the book of Genesis or the Old Testament books that talk about Abraham's story, it still far predates the existence of the nation of Israel to where it could be a fulfillment of God's promise. So even the worst of dating techniques makes you realize that this book was written at a time when the nation of Israel did not exist as we see it today or even as you see it later on in history. It didn't exist. And yet we know, we have it documented, that Abraham and Sarah, a a, a couple who couldn't even have children, And God's telling them, hey, I'm going to make many, many nations out of you, a great nation out of you. In fact, the whole world will be blessed. Every single nation will be blessed because of you, Abraham. And he's going, God, I'm like almost 100. Sarah's never been able to have children our whole life. I mean, think of how ridiculous that is. And yet, he believed in a God who makes exist what does not exist. Church, even if you deny all the spiritual elements in the story, if you just look at the physical facts, the fact is, I don't know of any other nation, there may be, I don't know of any other nation that can tie its origin back to one couple, like Israel. And they're still around. And not only that, just the physical nature of it, when he said you'd be a blessing to all nations, the fact that everyone knows that Jesus was a Jew, he came from the nation of Israel, and and here we are, people, we're in Laredo. We're not even close. Most of us have never even been to Israel. And yet hundreds and even thousands of people meet every single Sunday in our town to worship the person who is a descendant of Abraham. Even if you don't believe Jesus is God, how do you deal with the simple facts that what God said back then has absolutely to a T become true today? You have to have a whole lot of faith and a whole lot of nothing to not go, wow, look at this. This really happened. The God who says he can make something exist out of absolutely nothing actually did that in the person of Abraham's life. These are the living facts. We live seeing that promise fulfilled. People all over the world from non-Jewish nations worship the Savior who came from the Jews who is a descendant of Abraham whom God promised thousands of years ago that this would come from him. What else would we want to believe in, church? Why would we ever want to put our merit, our hope, in ourselves when we have a God of this nature who has revealed himself to us? How does he save by faith? The third question we're looking at, what kind of faith saves? Well, Paul goes on to describe the kind of faith that Abraham had. We're not talking about amount of faith. We talked about that last week. What the Bible talks more about is quantity or the quality of our faith. 
There is a quality of this faith that leads to salvation. It's a type of faith that you have when you meet God and see him and come face to face with him in a real way and you see who he is, that something happens where you believe in him, you trust in him, you have faith in him, and that faith, just as it was with Abraham, was credited to him as righteousness. So we're going to see a few things in here in this passage. Look what happens in verse 18. It says, in hope, this is talking about Abraham, Now, in hope, he believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations as he had been told. So he still went, 13 years he went after this conversation took place in the Old Testament before he had that promised son. He was told, so shall your offspring be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead. He was almost 100 years old, it says, since he was about 100 years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. There it is. You see it next? That's why. That's why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. Now, this does not mean that Abraham never doubted or acted contrary to his faith. The, The story tells us that. Twice he lied about his wife, Sarah. To, he thought protector. He said, oh, no, this is my sister, as he went to other more powerful nations, and those nations had a tendency to take people's wives from who were foreigners and bring them into their own harem. And he thought, this is going to happen, so I'm, just pretend you're my sister so he doesn't kill me and take you to be one of his wives. Twice he did that. Both times, those people took his wife, Sarah, and God intervened to protect her. Another time, you know the story, Abraham took things into his own hands, N- nothing like us. I mean, I don't know what Abraham was thinking because we people, we totally trust God. We never get in there and say, hey, God, I, I know what you want me to do. I think I got this handled. And Abraham thought that too. He and Sarah kind of worked things out. Hey, we're not having kids. It's been almost 10 years now, still not happening. But one of the local customs of their day was if you couldn't have children you, and you had a servant, you gave your servant to your husband and maybe she could bear children and those children would become your children. Now, God doesn't approve of that, but it was a common custom of their day, and so they tried that. And they ended up with a son, Ishmael, but if you read the story, you realize that that didn't go real well for him at all. So did Abraham have perfect faith, a faith that never, ever uh, doubted or, did, or struggled at all? No. That's not what this is talking about. It's talking about the characteristics of faith that continue and trust in God and and are convinced by it. So let me show you three things that this passage talks about in terms of the type of faith. And here's your point for you, and then we'll look through them. A faith that saves is shown in hope, trials, and confident trust in God's promises. A faith that saves is shown in hope, trials, and confident trust in God's promises. Again, it doesn't mean you don't ever doubt. It doesn't mean you don't ever struggle or you don't ever wrestle with anything. But what it does mean is when you believe in a God that makes exist what doesn't exist and, and can make alive what is dead, it sustains you and even strengthens you through situations where you come to the end of yourself. In fact, if you're honest as a Christian, and most of us or many of us aren't, you realize that it's in the most difficult times that you face that God is doing the greatest work in your life. A lot of modern Christianity has kind of thrown that under the table. It wants this health and wealth right now. It wants, bless me right here, God. I want it right here and right now in this world. But that's not how God works in this world because our promise and our hope is not in this world. It's these challenges, it's these trials, it's, it's having a, a, a promise that's out there to the future that we believe in that grows us in our faith. So let me describe to you, as we see in this passage, three characteristics uh, of the authentic faith that Paul describes here. The first one that you see in the passage, I'm going to highlight them as we go through it. If you go to the next 
Bart, we just walked through the verses we just looked at. Could you go to the next slide, the verse? There we go. In hope, he believed against hope. So you can just jot these in your notes if you want underneath it or underline them in your Bible. In hope, he believed against hope. It's a, it's a kind of faith that realizes, I have very little hope in this world. My wife's barren. I'm old. Man, but against those odds, I'm hoping in you, God. So it's a kind of hope that realizes where your trust is. See, if you continue to trust in the things of this world, then your faith is not in God. It's in the things of this world. And the kind of faith that saves is a kind of faith that says, my hope isn't here, my hope is in the one who made the promise. The second thing we see in this passage uh, is that it grows through weakness and trials. Look at what Abraham did here. He said he did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was good as dead, he was about 100, when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. That didn't weaken it, but he grew strong in his faith and gave glory to God. So the second thing we see is that it grows through weaknesses and trials rather than weakens. And here's what I like about this kind of biblical faith, is it's not just this wishy-washy, I'm going to deny the circumstances that I'm in. Read what the passage said. When he considered, Abraham actually pondered his circumstances. He didn't deny them. He didn't say, in the name of Jesus, I'm younger than I really am. He didn't pretend that he was anything different because his hope wasn't in him. It wasn't even in his own faith. It was in the God who raises from the dead those who die and the God who makes exist what doesn't exist. He could dwell and be honest about his current circumstances and know that that doesn't deter my faith because I'm not trusting in myself. I'm trusting in him and what he has done. That's the beauty of it. And finally, it's fully convinced. It's fully convinced. Look at the last little phrase in here. He was fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. See, trust is a huge thing. We either have it in ourselves or something in this world or we have it in God. And you either need to be fully convinced that you can accomplish what you think you can accomplish or be convinced that he can do it. Those are your options. So far, mankind hasn't proven to get a whole lot better over many, many years. As much as we think that we have the answers for all these things, we fall back into the exact same cycles over and over again. But Abraham was fully convinced of what God could do. We need to, first of all, a couple things that are important in this is this isn't making up our own promises and then convincing ourselves that they're going to come true. It's knowing God's promises and banking our lives on him and his promises. Romans 10, 17, what we'll get to in uh, the next series says this, so faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. This is so important. It goes back to something we talked about before. A lot of people just want to talk about faith is saving, but it's not faith that saves. It's faith in Jesus Christ that saves. It's the object of your faith that's the most important. Faith is simply that means by which we receive it. Here it's telling us. So faith comes from what? It comes from hearing. What? Hearing what? From hearing the word of Christ. Because when you see him, when you hear about him, when we gather here, this is why this is such an important thing for us as a church. This is why every time you gather in your small groups, it's so important that you hear God's word because those things are what stir our faith. Every time you open the Word of God, what you are doing is you are exercising your faith. And that's why God does it by faith. So that when we're at the end of ourselves, when we are absolutely done with ourselves, we are finally at the best place to trust Him instead of trusting ourselves. Hebrews 11.1 one defines faith like this. Now, faith is the assurance. There it is. It's convinced. The assurance of things hoped for. There we saw the same thing he talked about Abraham. The conviction of things not seen. So that's the quality of faith or the type of faith that saves. It's a faith that's, its confidence is in God and and not in itself, and it strengthens as we go through our seasons here in life. But the last one is, how can I receive 
Uh, or how can I be saved by this faith? And Paul goes on to now connect this passage to us today. He says in verse 23, but the words it was counted to him were not written for his sake alone, meaning God didn't just say those things to Abraham simply for his sake, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. So Paul is making that connection. He says, Abram was believing in God's promise that was going to come. And he believed into the future, not even fully knowing how all that would come about. But Paul says, it, it's the same for us. Our faith is credited as righteousness, just like Abraham's was. His look forward to that hope. Ours look back in terms of the person who would provide it for us to Jesus Christ. And here's our final point, in a sense, in that passage. Is I, do I believe, and it's a question, I'm going to ask you this question. Do I believe God's promise that he delivered Jesus Christ up for my trespasses and raised him for my justification? Do I believe that? Do I trust in it? I, I, am I fully convinced? See, this isn't a, a, a simple intellectual knowledge of this. It's hoping in that. It's realizing that is your only hope. That is your only chance of being righteous before God. Are you convinced? It's an internal convincing trust that God has done this for me. And it is my only hope of being righteous before him. It's not Jesus and his death and his resurrection plus all my good works. Jesus justifies us. He not only forgives us, and many of us understand that, yeah, he forgave our sins, but you don't realize that his resurrection justifies you as well. It means you're complete. You are righteous in him. It's not you plus all your good stuff that you do that are piling up in terms of your position before God. It means it's finished. It's done. And now your life is simply a living out of who you are in Christ. So have you placed your confidence in God and his son for your salvation? Is it 100% there? Are you convinced? And that when even things don't go the way you would want them to go in this world, just like it did, in a sense, for him from a worldly perspective, when everyone had turned their backs on him, when he was wrongly and unjustly accused and beaten beyond recognition and hung on a cross, his hope and his faith remained in the only thing that he knew would raise him from the dead. Does that characterize us too, church? Do we really believe in a God who has done that for us so that when difficulties come our way, we're not running for some other quick fix to get us out of that hole, but it pushes us to our knees and reminds us that, God, I praise you that my hope is not in this world, that my promises will not be fulfilled by the things that this world can offer. But my hope is in you. And, and even if this situation I'm in leads to my death, which eventually, I, I don't want to let the cat out of the bag, people, but eventually some situation you're in is going to lead to death. I, I mean, that's not a big secret. But you know what? Even if it leads to your death sooner than you think, even that cannot squelch the promise that God has made to you and to me through Jesus Christ because he can raise the dead to life. You see, many of us recognize that Jesus died for our sins, but many of us don't consider that his resurrection has secured and provided our justification. You aren't just forgiven. You are justified. You are made righteous in him. And you stand right with him now. And like Abraham, a true Christian will consider the reality of his or own life and realize that he is dead if salvation requires a work on my part. Abraham considered his life and he said, man, this ain't going to work, God. There's no way this can be fulfilled if this depends on me. And it was in that weakness, it was in Abraham considering his circumstances that it strengthened his hope 
in the God who had made a promise to him. Church, we're embarking on a new journey as we build a new campus. And I just want to be real honest with you right now. If we simply aim to do something that we can accomplish in our own strength and our, our own abilities, then we're going to end up with something that our strength and our abilities are able to accomplish. Just like Abraham did. Remember what, when Abraham said, I, hey, I got this, God, I, I can take care of it. Let me do it in my own strength. He ended up with an Ishmael and a whole bunch of problems that came with it. But if we are a people of faith, a people who don't look to build a building, because that's not what we're embarking on as a journey. If we have the faith to see beyond the bricks and mortar of a building and see the actual descendants of Abraham, of those who place their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, in the future, the hundreds, possibly thousands of people that that place could facilitate their growth, their maturity, their hearing of the good news of Jesus Christ because a handful of people presently saw past just some bricks, some rooms, some spaces and saw not a building but a church saw those who are yet to come, people who right now are dead in our city spiritually. They have no knowledge of what it means to have a relationship with God. But because a group of people believes that God can raise from the dead and give life where there's no present life, those people saw beyond just that stuff to the lives that would be changed for many, many generations. Church, if we have a faith that's placed properly in God, then there's no telling what he could do with a group of people that believe in him. There's no telling what he could provide, what could exist that does not exist right now. You and I all know what I'm talking about because at one point in your life you were not where you are today and some past person brought a, a, a news of Jesus Christ into your life that's changed your eternity forever and that's the same gift that's the same opportunity that's the same vision that we have for our city it may seem impossible just as it did for Abraham. But that's where faith comes in. It's seeing the future of a city that desperately needs this truth. The future of a city that is so broken, that is so far from a God whom hundreds of people go to to religiously worship every single week and yet don't know the heart of what it means to have a relationship with God. Don't know how much he loves them and what he provided for them in Jesus Christ, not in their religious duties. What if this church were part of something that totally transformed this city? What if we said, God, what do you want us to do today so that the future of the city may be much past the time I'm even here, much like Abraham never saw the fulfillment of this promise, but his faith made him hope for something that was to come rather than dwell for the moment in his present life. What if that was our church? What if God wanted to use us bring something about that could transform our city. That's a faith that puts its hope in a big, big God. That's what Paul is talking about here when he examined Abraham's faith. My prayer is that I could have that kind of faith. That we could have that kind of faith and see things that we'll never see when we just look 
with our earthly eyes. 